first like to say thanks for the invitation from Dominic to come speak, and of course to Andrea for putting all of this together. Um, I'm going to be talking today on Energia Optics and Photography's first decade in England, which is the first bit of a new project for me, uh, which comes out of research that I did in the fall as a fellow at the Ransom Center in Austin. And I should say, just as a preface, that most of the archival images that you'll see are in the collections at UT. In 1844, the British chemist and budding photographer Robert Hunt developed a new process he quite curiously named the Energia type. So, of course, we're talking here about the transition between EP and AP. As we can see in a faded example of this method depicting an ethereal silhouette of several tall trees towering over a row of low lying buildings, the Energia type produced brown, monochromatic images that have not stood up particularly well to the passage of time. The process itself is identical to the technique also known as the ferrotype, in which a negative image is developed by brushing an iron compound across the surface of sensitized paper that has been exposed to light. This negative image could be produced by exposure within a camera and then reversed into a positive image using contact printing, as Hunt did with the untitled example we see here. Though a notable contribution to the nascent photographic technologies of the 1840s, the Energia type is less of interest for its chemistry than for the ideas underlying its name. Indeed, Energia type was a name selected by Hunt for reasons unrelated to the specific materials the process required. As such, this name is telling in that it arises from an important but short-lived hypothesis about the nature of light that was developed directly through photographic research. Like many of the early English photographers, Hunt was trained as a scientist, or a natural philosopher in the parlance of the day, and gained an interest in photography as much for its experimental potential for science as for its potential as a form of art. Along these lines, he first, his first published article on photography in 1840 proclaimed the inappreciable value of the new medium to art and science, and he would soon follow this by publishing the first history of the photographic medium written in English a study reprinted some half dozen times throughout the 1840s and 1850s, thus helping to establish Hunt as a central figure in the burgeoning field of photography. And I just want to say briefly, these two photographs are the only two that are like this in UT's archives and are unlike any photograph I've ever seen from the mid-19th century. It looks more like something produced in the Bauhaus. My paper today is not exclusively on Robert Hunt but instead begins with his work as a photographer, historian, and scientist as means to examine the intertwined relationship of photographic technology and theories of energy at the respective inceptions of these two fields. For the past several years, I've been interested in a way of understanding photographic technology as enmeshed within the energy circulation of the world's ecosystems. That is, instead of fixating on the static quality of the photographic image as a material representation of its subject, I've attempted to think about the entire photographic process as part of the continuous movement of photo energy throughout the Earth. Viewed from this perspective, the photographic subject and object are not separate things, but rather densities within a vast distribution of potential and active forces. I came to this way of thinking about light-based media through research on conceptual arts and theories of ecology in the 1960s and 1970s, particularly by artists such as we see here, Walter de Maria and Robert Berry, but this research in turn drew my attention to the fact that the technology of photography, the field of ecology, and the scientific theorization of energy all emerged within a few decades of one another in the mid-19th century in Western Europe. <coughs> Rather than mere coincidence, I understand the intersection of these three major historical episodes to be intimately connected to the radically new understanding of light as a waveform that began to take hold in the early 19th century. Likewise, it was the wave theory of light, or what contemporaries call the undulatory theory, which served as the precursor to the groundbreaking accounts of thermodynamics and electromagnetism of the 1850s and 1860s that now provide the conceptual bedrock for a present-day understanding of the world as a complex network of energy. What I have come to find out, however, is that the emergence of photography and ideas about energy, though very close to one another among a generation of Englishmen at that time, had a far more uneven development. 
As various commentators have noted, photography was one of many technologies that fundamentally reshaped 19th century thought and experience. But alongside these other transformative inventions of the telegraph, railroad, and steam engine, the history of photography lacks precision with respect to the specific kinds of knowledge photographs stimulated. It was the steam engine, for instance, that provided the crucible for the laws of thermodynamics. Its capacity for converting potential energy into actual work, giving rise to wide-reaching ideas of the nature of work capacity and heat death in a closed system, including that of the universe itself. Tellingly, photography also generated ideas about light energy, but these claims were constrained by several factors to which, to understand, we'll need to consider first what Hunt meant by the related notion of energia in his energia type, and second, the scientific contributions of Hunt's close associate, Sir John Herschel, notable work of which we see here. Following Hunt's discovery of iron as a developing agent in photography, he generously shared his finding through the publication of a short entry in the Philosophic Magazine. It is here that he explains his choice of the designation energia type, which he proposes, quote, distinguishes this process by a name which has a general rather than a particular application. Regarding all photographic phenomena as due to the principle energia, I would nevertheless distinguish this very interesting process as the energia type. As employed here, the term energia shares the same Greek root as the term energy that had begun to enter scientific discourse at the same moment through notable contemporaries of Hunt's, such as James Clerk Maxwell and William Thompson. But energia is not equivalent to this latter notion, which is to say Hunt does not use the term to refer to work capacity. Energia refers instead to a concept with a relatively short lifespan in the mid-19th century. Along with Herschel, Hunt was interested in optics, and specifically in trying to explain how light actually produced photographic images. In his attempt to answer this question, he adopted a hypothesis that each beam of sunlight is composed of three separate elements, visible light, <laughs> heat, and what he called energia. His third term, Hunt maintained, is the element of light that agitates matter and causes it to undergo dynamic reactions. As Hunt explains in a treatise entitled Researches on Light, quote, Light, heat, and photographic power are beyond all doubt three distinct classes of phenomena. Now the science of optics has its nomenclature, as does the science of thermotics. It is therefore essential to the successful prosecution of our inquiries that the third class of phenomena, which we have been particularly engaged in consideration of, should have a term by which it might be distinguished. Might we not then, with strict propriety, regarding this principle as the sun's energetic power working in and producing change in bodies, adopt such a term as energon, energy, or slightly modifying it, use such a coinage as energia. Energia is that power which affects all the changes, whether chemical or molecular, which are constantly in progress. It is that agent which is forever quickening all the elements of growth and maintaining the conditions of a healthful vitality is no less energetically employed in the processes of corruption. Thus, for Hunt, energia was indeed the aspect of sunlight that we now associate with the energetic power to support life of ecosystems on Earth. But in describing this concept as imperceptible to the human senses, he imbued it with an almost magical quality as a presence that gives and takes away life and is knowable through its results, but not by its direct presence. These ideas about optics were, in fact, greatly influenced by Hunt's relationship with Herschel, who was considered leading, if not the leading, authority on light theory during the mid-19th century. He was also one of the earliest practitioners of photography. Within a week of learning about the discovery of the daguerreotype in January 1839, Herschel independently developed his own photographic processes, which he shared with his friend, William Henry Fox Talbot, upon the latter's visit to Herschel's home in Slow England that February. During this course of the 1840s, he would offer a number of contributions to the field, such as the invention of the cyanotype, two examples of which we see here, and experiments with different vegetable dyes in the production of anthotypes. Basically, Herschel was attempting to invent color photography in the 1840s. In addition, Herschel played a significant part in solidifying the word photography itself, which he favored in place of Talbot's more cumbersome phrase, photogenic drawing. The language of positive and negative photographic images is also Herschel, in addition to the first credited use of the term snapshot. 
But beyond Herschel's own limited photographic production, his deeper influence over early English photography stems from his evolving understanding of light, an understanding that was in turn impacted by the scientific work of his father. John's father, William, was the most important astronomer of his generation. He trained as a musician before he taught himself to build telescopes, and then went on to hypothesize infrared light and discover the planet Uranus, the first new planet identified since antiquity. The elder Herschel was a pragmatic intellect of the first order, and when his son John excelled in mathematics at Cambridge, largely by importing advanced calculus from continental Europe to England, it seemed to many that the younger Herschel was on his way to the same heights of accomplishment, an assumption that stayed with John Herschel throughout his lifetime. This biographical sketch is important to understanding the scientific and photographic work of John Herschel, because by the time that he began making photographs in 1839, he had already dedicated two decades of his life to painstakingly proving his father's astronomical claims about double stars and nebulae. Thus, John Herschel's intellectual formation is characterized equally by strong inclinations towards the most advanced work being done across Europe, while also remaining hesitant to reject the received knowledge of his father's generation, and particularly his father himself. In sum, John Herschel was very intelligent, highly influential, but not particularly original in his thinking. And while a select few of his contemporaries came to the same assessment, the vast majority held him in the highest possible esteem, an estimation that is confirmed by the fact that after his death in 1871, he was buried alongside Sir Isaac Newton in Westminster Abbey. When Charles Darwin died a decade later, he was buried on Herschel's other side. This perception of Herschel matters, because while the other English photographers of the 1840s and 50s were also natural philosophers, they did not possess Herschel's clout, and his own complex commitments to theories and practices, both new and old, was pivotal in shaping the advancement of thought about both photography and its relationship to energetics. Herschel's work with photography as a laboratory technology gave rise to the very ideas about light that would soon appear in unpublished histories of the medium. In February 1840, Herschel read a paper before the Royal Society that describes a series of effects that he claims could hardly have been predicted a priori before the advent of photography. Specifically, Herschel was puzzled by the observation that, quote, the chemical spectrum, as indicated merely by the length of its photographic impression, should include within its limits the whole luminous spectrum, ext extending much beyond the extremist visible red rays on the one hand, and on the other to a surprising distance beyond the violet. One important aspect of this statement pertains to photography's capacity to reveal the invisible presence of infrared and ultraviolet radiation. But perhaps what might perplex the 21st century reader more is Herschel's differentiation between what he calls the luminous and chemical spectrums of light. Following his father's discovery of infrared, which registers heat but is not visible to the naked eye, John had adopted the elder Herschel's assertion that the spectrum of light was not only divided into colors, but also into different qualities. Its extreme red side was characterized by heat, the center by visible light, and the violet end by refrangible rays. According to Herschel's understanding preceding the invention of photography, these three qualities, heat, visibility, and refraction, overlap with one another along a continuous spectrum. From examining his own photographs, however, Herschel reworked this received knowledge. As his essay of 1840 indicates, he began to think that the chemical spectrum of light overlapped far more with the luminous than had previously been imagined. Rather than supposing these properties to exist along a single spectrum, however, he proposed that luminosity, heat, and chemical effects of sunlight each have their own separate spectrums. Two years later, he had further shored up this hypothesis and wrote to a colleague at the University of Edinburgh that, quote, the operative rays, if I mistake not, are something different from either heat or light. This separates them from calorific rays, which lie in great and increasing abundance at the end of and beyond the spectrum, and they are equally separated from light by the broad distinction of existing vision. Herschel surmises here that photographs are actually created by what he calls the operative rays of light, which is to say rays that affect chemical change and that exist entirely discreetly from both light and heat. He soon began to call these the actinic ray, which is a double locution of Greek and English meaning the radiating ray which hints at the privilege that Herschel afforded to their energetic effects. He even went so far as to suggest that contributions to photography actually belong to a special branch of the sciences called actinochemistry. And while actinochemistry
chemistry did not catch on as a new name for the field of photography, Herschel's ideas would nonetheless impact the emerging field in England, in large part via the influence of Hunt, who throughout his career consistently described the chemical effects of photography by way of Herschel's separatist explanation of light. On the subject of providing names for these new technologies, Hunt would opine that, quote, photography is clearly a misnomer. Since the pictures, so-called, are not drawn by light, noting further that he would advocate a return to the term introduced by Niepce, heliography, sun drawing, which leaves the question of the particular agent affecting chemical change still open for examination. On the subjects of optics and naming, it is also significant that by the 1851, Hunt had backed away from the term energia and began to use Herschel's terminology of actinic rays in its place. On the whole, Herschel was resistant to, resistant to the science of energy, a resistance that we might grasp by taking a glance at an 1864 letter he wrote to William Thompson. In this missive, Herschel informs Thompson that he is not convinced by the newly conceived law that energy is neither created nor destroyed in the universe. His stated reasons are twofold. First, Herschel didn't particularly care for the terminology of energy for use in the sciences because the word already had a meaning in everyday English. Accordingly, the instances that Herschel himself employs the word in his writing consistently align with the less technical notion of energy common in the 19th century as an expression of vigor, whether metaphorically in speech or actually in physical exertion. Herschel instead preferred the phrase vis viva, Latin for living force. His second complaint about the conservation of energy was based in his understanding of philosophical induction. Given limited experiments with machines in the laboratory, he reasoned, one simply cannot jump to conclusions about the nature of the universe. As he explains to Thompson, I think it would be exceedingly difficult to say where in winding up a clock weight, or stretching a string, a spring, or combining two gases into a solid, the total vis viva of the universe undergoes an increase or a diminution, or to show in what cases it is an increase and what a diminution. Assuredly, it is extremely unlikely to have remained unaltered. For Herschel, then, one of the problems with the thinking of Thompson and others about the conservation of energy was that discrete observations had too quickly been turned into a theory, meaning a theory that could be then be, then be used to explain and to predict other phenomena. During an era when theories about phlogiston and the corpuscular nature of light had been rejected after extensive public quarreling, Herschel preferred to keep new propositions about nature and phenomena on the level of the hypothesis, below that of the theory, so that he maintained experiment would still guide the advance of new claims rather than theoretical deductions. Herschel's equivocations about observation also impacted his thinking about optics. As I have mentioned already, he would resist the laws of thermodynamics throughout his lifetime and hold on to his hypothesis that the separate spectrums of the luminous, calorific, and actinic rays long after his peers had rejected it in favor of a unified electromagnetic spectrum. While this might perhaps seem to be a simply a case of personal ego, Herschel's stubbornness on this point has notable implications for the subsequent relationships of photography, light, and ecological thought. This is because the theories of thermodynamics that Herschel resisted were indeed heavily influenced by the mechanics of industrial power, which cast a shadow over advanced ecological thinking well into the 1970s, at which time the entire planet was thought to operate like one immense, finely programmed machine. Herschel's and Hunt's ideas about the living quality of light, its vis viva, that they derived from studying photographs, might have generated a more holistic, less predictive notion of of photo energy in the environment, and perhaps even a less controlling attitude to environmental engineering during the ecologically disastrous 20th century. Except for the fact that Herschel and his cohort were also deeply committed to an 18th century attitude of keeping all things separate until they are proven to be evil. This suggests that early English photography was caught in a profoundly vexed position. While we may not wish to maintain its assumptions, we would do well to remember the intertwining of pastness and futurity wrapped up in its development. Thank you.